is up dodger fans hope you're surviving that la rain or wherever you might be in socal it's been wet out there folks so stay dry kevin klein speaking your los angeles dodgers have made some moves today here we are recording on february 5th some bullpen deck shuffling here on the incline dodgers podcast which is presented by tick pick and fan sided let's dive right into it the dodgers bring back a guy that jake reiner was clamoring for all offseason right-handed reliever ryan brazier has agreed to a two-year contract with the los angeles dodgers and this is a lot cheaper than i expected two years nine million dollars with some bonus incentives tied in there this seemed like a no-brainer after the way the relief market really shifted a guy that had an 070 era with the los angeles dodgers and got everybody out ryan brazier back with the dodgers let me pass it over to jake reiner because i'm sure he wants to victory dance right now you said no brainer. This was a no brazier. Okay. We've been wanting this all off season, especially me. Bad. I, uh, bad. yeah. Was it, was it bad? Yeah. I, I thought it was, I thought it was great. Obviously. I'm glad you liked it. Um, but it, whatever, it doesn't matter if you find me funny or disgusting. Ryan Brazier is coming back to the Dodgers and that's all that matters. I'm just so happy that uh, they were able to keep him. I know a lot of people were talking about his age and regression and all that stuff. And, I don't care. I, I've i seen enough work from him. He was so dominant last year that how could you not give him one more shot at it? I, I mean, the bullpen is pretty stacked as it is. They needed another high leverage reliever in there so that they can bridge the gap a little bit easier to uh, Phillips in the ninth. And Brazier does that. I mean, he is that new fireman role in the event that Fire Eisen and Trinan, which both those guys look to be on track, which is great. But in the event that they do not bring it or get hurt or whatever, you have Ryan Brazier as a fail safe. So I, I couldn't be happier about this move. Bullpen is stacked. Can't wait to talk about it more. David Rosenthal, how you doing out there? Repping that Michigan national or Michigan shirt of the national champions. Yeah, national champions till the next season and beyond forever. Uh, this is a huge addition for the Dodgers. Uh, they definitely needed one more bullpen guy, and they got him. So I like this bullpen a lot. I mean, if you factor in a healthy Blake Trinan, who said he's the best he's been feeling since, what, 21 or 20, I think he said? 21, yeah. Trinan, Phillips, Gratterall, Brazier, Vesia. That's pretty damn good for your top five guys. Uh, and, yes, I – the, the Caleb Ferguson trade, which we'll talk about later, uh, was a little little confusing for me. Uh, but Ryan Brazier is a reverse splits guy. So he he does very well against lefties. Uh, so that, that kind of handles that. Uh, again, those top five guys, you're not going to find much better if Brazier and Trinan uh, are healthy and good anywhere in the league. So this was a huge, huge uh, reunion for sure. Also, Brazier, Trinan, Gratterall, all reverse splits guys. They can all get lefties out. So the sort of prototypical lefty, uh, you know, killer in the bullpen, that sort of is going away a little bit and especially has gone away significantly since they put in the three batter minimum rule. Um, you know, guys like Adam Kalerik are pretty much out of the league because of that. So they're finding that not only can they afford to give up a guy like Ferguson or get him off the roster. They can replace him with a guy that could have said that essentially does that and more. Yeah. It's the first year where it feels like the Dodgers are actually bringing back the crew. They also brought back Joe Kelly, who is another guy who just got everybody out with the Dodgers. I believe he had a 174 ERA. So Dave Roberts is going to have a lot of options to really slice it and dice it going into next season. We assume Evan Phillips will be the closer. They haven't officially announced that Evan Phillips is the dictated closer, but you have to imagine he's the front runner was phenomenal for the Dodgers last season, but you never know. It could end up being Brazier. It could end up being Gratterall. It's just, it's, it really falls into how the Dodgers feel about. They might not even be done adding relievers with the Ferguson trade, which we can get into right now. The Dodgers really only have one solid lefty, and that's Alex Vesia, who wasn't even good for the Dodgers last season. Now they Yarbrough. Picked, well, we can get into Yarbrough, but he's not really a full high leverage reliever by trade. 
he might be starting. No, I was just because you mentioned lefties. I, I didn't right, say yeah. leverage. And we don't even know if Yarbrough is coming out of the pen to start the season. He might have to start games for the Dodgers because there are some uncertainties with the health of James Paxton. And they already said Walker Buehler won't start the season on a, for the Dodgers. He'll be on the injured list. So that James Paxton news really did throw kind of a wrench into their plans because I thought he was healthy when they gave him the contract. And apparently he might not be healthy. They had to decrease his contract value from like 13 million to 7 million. But anyways, what are your guys' thoughts on Caleb Ferguson actually getting traded? This one is kind of bittersweet in a weird way because he showed flashes of just absolute dominance, lockdown, uh, relief pitching. And then he also on the other end of the spectrum was a gas can at some times and really got into some bad stretches. He's a good reliever. I mean, just by looking at his stats, looking what he's done, he's a solid reliever and the Yankees are lucky to have a guy like that in their bullpen. So I'm sorry to see him go. I had no idea that he was even you know, in the, on the chopping block or on the trade block, uh, it just kind of came out of nowhere, uh, with that news. So that was a little weird, but honestly, I, I, I'm, I'm fine with it because of what they added. Um, and, and I, and I trust that this front office is, is they, they typically handle the bullpen really well. That's one of their biggest strengths. Yeah, it was, it was definitely surprising for me. It kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, I, I do think we are kind of been helping the Yankees a little a little too much in the last couple of years. I mean, we gave them Clayton Beater for nothing. I mean, it was Joey Gallo, but it ended up being nothing. Uh, and the guys we got back from the Yankees, one of them is a 19-year-old kid who hasn't pitched out a rookie ball yet. Uh, somewhat encouraging stuff. I watched a couple of highlights today. Looked okay for a 19-year-old. Uh, and then this guy, Matt Gage, who I've never heard of, but he's left-handed. So I don't know how I feel about helping the Yankees a lot. Uh, but other than that, I, again, like I said at the top of the show, I, I'm very confident in this bullpen. Uh, and, you know, worst case scenario, they make some trades at the deadline too. Yankees riding that. Gonzalez. I was about to say Yankees yeah. riding that Dodgers 2020 <clears throat> bullpen right now with the lefties, Victor and Caleb. Yeah, and Beater's going to be on their, on their roster at some point this year for sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't mind trading Beater because there's just really no place for him on this Dodgers roster. I mean, we still have to find a way to get River Ryan on this 40 man, and he's probably even better than Clayton Beater. So well, I think too- I think Beater's going to be a reliever. Oh well, then yeah, that makes me even less concerned, to be honest. Yeah, Kyle Hurt, baby. Hopefully, we get to see some of him. But, anyways. I was also surprised initially with this trade. I was not expecting Caleb Ferguson to go anywhere, especially this late into the offseason. I figured with Josh Hader going to the Astros and we didn't trade for Tanner Scott yet, which I'm still hoping I would love Tanner Scott. I think he'd be an awesome pickup for the Dodgers. But Ferguson and Vestia, they were kind of really inconsistent last season. To me, they kind of are almost the same at this point in their careers. Both of them were also reverse splits ish. They kind of both were hit hard by lefties. I was surprised to look that up. They both were hit about 270 from left handed hitters last season. No shit. And then with Ferguson as well, he only threw a fastball really. He kind of gave up on throwing the off speed curve slider, whatever you want to call it. So to me, ultimately, it's not a huge loss. He was in the final year of his contract and he didn't have any minor league options, anyways. Not getting my hopes up for Matt Gage, the 30-year-old that was recently DFA'd by the Astros like a week ago, then picked up by the Yankees. Now he's a Dodger, but he does throw 94 miles per hour, so that's encouraging. He throws a cutter and a slider, and on top of that, he'll be on the 40-man, but he does have some minor league options. I guess we'll find out in spring training if he's any good, but... I mean, the Dodgers have found guys that I didn't expect in the past to rise to the occasion. So maybe they see something with a gauge. And um, when it comes to the other guy, they picked up Christian Zazueta, the right-handed pitcher. I don't know too much about him either, but yeah, like David, like David said, he's 19 and he could end up becoming something, but that's just way down the line. My toxic trait is that I feel like the Dodgers could fix me. So if that's possible, they can also fix this guy gauge. I just think that anytime the Dodgers pick up a reliever that we've never heard of before, or 
may have gotten cut by the Astros, like Kevin mentioned. <clears throat> I honestly like giving them the benefit of the doubt because why not? I mean, at this point, the track record speaks for itself. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm i with you. I, I just also wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't even make it to spring training. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but it, but it's like, you know, if he makes it great, if he doesn't, whatever. I mean, it, it's yeah, kind it's, of a... I, you know, Ferguson is a free agent at the end of the year, so... It's a yeah. one year, one year deal for him on in New the York. Move, the move was to get rid of Ferguson to clear the spot. So that's what that was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They just want nothing to do with him apparently because February 8th is right around the corner. And with Frasso, May, and Gonsolin expected to miss the most of the season, if not all of it, in Frasso's case and Gonsolin, that would open up three spots on the 40 man roster. One of them is going to go to Brazier, obviously. So they'll have two spots. And I know David wants that Clayton Kershaw reunion so badly. And we're this deep into the off season. Like, why would you not? I heard a number of Dodgers players reference Clayton Kershaw during the Dodger fest this past weekend. Bobby Miller referred to him as a mentor. Tyler glass. Now growing up a Dodger fan mentioned that he loved watching Clayton Kershaw pitch. So there really is no excuse. If Kershaw is insistent, on coming back for this 2024 season, then the Dodgers really do need to get this done. I know Brandon Gomes talked about him at Dodger Fest as well, and they they're in talks. I mean, it's, a, it's he's not. I just don't see a world where he's not signed. Like, how would you make a decision after your entire career to leave Los Angeles in the off season that they signed Shohei Otani and Yamamoto, not just Otani and Yamamoto? It just it would make no sense whatsoever. Uh, you can you can miss me with all the well his family and his kids and Dallas and blah blah blah. I don't care. I just don't care. It makes no sense ever for anyone in the history of Earth to leave this Dodgers roster this off season by choice. It just makes no sense. Next year, okay, he's not that old. People forget. People act like Clayton Kershaw is like 37, 38. He's not. He's got if he's healthy, he's got years left. If he's healthy and pitching well, he is he could pitch for another five years. So I don't I don't think he's leaving at all. I, I just don't see it. I'll I'll never be able to see it, and especially not this offseason. It's it is weird though, because he continues to sign these one year deals. So he's taking it year year by year, even if even if he has five years left in the tank physically. So clearly he's kind of playing it by ear every, every single year. And it's, and it's kind of funny because in all the years that, that it would make sense to go play for Texas, this one would be the one that would make the most sense for him because they just won the world series. But to your point, David, I don't think you could leave Los Angeles. Not when the, the, you know, the, the 3000 strikeout thing is, is looming it's right in a Dodger there. uniform. That, that thing is important not only to him, I bet, but definitely Dodgers fans. They want to see him retire a Dodger. So I, I, I can't see him leaving either. And I mean, look, they can move guys to the 60 day, di 60 day IL on Thursday. So you could see maybe a signing then, and then they just immediately put him on the 60 day. Yeah. I, I think his decision has been made. Uh, I think they're just kind of waiting for this deadline to pass. And I'm not saying that it's going to be immediate, but I, I think he's made his decision, whatever it is. It's also just a bad year to leave because the Dodgers are the World Series favorites, and it's not like years past where well, they were just kind of granted into being the World Series favorites. This year, they are like legitimate World Series favorites. On paper, if healthy, I can't think of a better team that would be able to beat the Dodgers. Obviously, they have to play the game, and we've seen crazier shit happen like the Diamondbacks sweeping the Dodgers. Yeah, let's, or Padres. let's slow down Dave Roberts over there. Let's but slow down a bit. We, on we, paper, the Dodgers, yeah. everyone wants to beat the Dodgers. Every, and I'll year talk on about paper. Every year on paper, that's what it is. Except for maybe last year, but they Except won 100 games year. anyway. They did win 100 games. It was an impressive regular season without a doubt. If you haven't hit that, if you haven't smashed that like button just yet, please do it, <laughs> Dodger fans. We need... We need all the support out there and hit the subscribe button. God damn it. Let's get into some more topics here. So why don't we talk some Shohei Otani? Shohei Otani, 
was back at Dodger Stadium. He did the press conference. I'm well aware of that. But this was the first time we actually got to see him wearing a Los Angeles Dodgers uniform. And let me tell you, it was like a rock concert. Fans were absolutely hyped. The stadium erupted when they spotted Shohei Otani, who arrived at Dodger Stadium around 3 o'clock, I want to say. And then he made his way over to the stage. And all cameras were on Otani. 180 something reporters. Some of them were fraudulent, but they snuck in there anyways, <laughs> just so that they could get a close up look on Shohei Otani, who to me is the biggest athlete to sign in Los Angeles since Shaquille O'Neal. If I have that wrong, correct me, but in their or prime, LeBron. No. in their, in their prime, I would say Shaq. Oh, in their prime. Uh, sorry. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't hear that little. No, it's all good. Thing. But like, in their prime, a guy that's ready to deliver championships right away. Shaq, now Otani. That's how I feel personally. If you want to correct me in the chat, go for it. But my biggest takeaways was one, there were some pictures and you could see his like elbow. There was pretty gnarly scar. I don't know if you guys saw that. Yeah. Obviously, that was from the surgery. Um, they were asking him some questions about where, he, where he's at with his health. He's not going to pitch this year, but it doesn't matter. In terms of where he's at in spring training, it does sound like it's going to be kind of hit or miss. He will probably take some days off just as he's recovering from that elbow surgery. But he's optimistic he will be ready for that Korea series, which I believe March 20th. Pretty early. It's kind of weird. I was looking at the schedule. I did not realize they play two in Korea. Then they play three exhibition against the Angels. And they yeah. go back to playing regular games. It's weird. It's very bizarre. Very bizarre. And so, I mean, obviously they spread it out for travel, but to go from <laughs> games that count to exhibition games, I've never seen that before. Yeah. People are going to overreact to that Korea series so hard, whatever happens either way. That is true, but I'm hyped. It's going to be oh, awesome. This is going to be the season of overreactions. Yeah. <laughs> Damn straight. Um, so some other things, Otani is already out in Arizona as of today. He's training a lot of cool photos of him. Big in and out guy. He that's his favorite. Apparently fits right into Southern California. Now, obviously he's been with the angels for like six years, so it's not a shocker, but if there was ever a time to sponsor and put a patch on the Dodgers uniform in and out, you better be first in line. Cause that's a great marketing opportunity to right there. In and out doesn't really do commercials, but if they ever just decide to do a legit one, Otani needs to be the spokesperson throwing yeah, that out there they, right I now. mean, it's, it sells itself in an Otani. I mean, in and out Tani. I mean, whatever you, however you slice it, it's a, it's a great campaign waiting to happen. I just yeah. have a comment about Shohei real quick. Like, does this guy, I mean, this guy eats, sleeps and breathes baseball. It, it, it's crazy. How many times we've seen him at Dodger stadium, just every single, and now this may be the case with a lot of other players that don't get a lot of notoriety and the, the you know, the Dodgers don't, post all over their social media but honestly i feel like he's sort of leading by example here getting out working out and then he you know seems like five minutes after he left fan fest he's in arizona training mm -hmm. for you know spring training and what what a great you know role model not only for the veterans on this team but also the young guys to say this guy's the the highest paid player in major league baseball and he's out here grinding every single day I saw him talking to James Altman. I, I think Altman was out there uh, during the uh, Camelback Ranch session. Yeah. So, I mean, so cool. Just, just really, really cool that he he's so he's so focused. Yeah, I mean, it's. I feel like he will definitely elevate people's. You know, and it's not to say that they aren't already, you know, focused and and doing this for a living. But I, I think when you see that the best player in baseball is doing this, that's going to put something in your mind that says, you know what, maybe I will actually do this extra thing. So I, I think it's a good, and he doesn't even have to do anything other than be himself to make an impact. And I think that's, that's a, that's an unspoken and un, you know, quantifiable aspect of, of that contract as well. I really like this comment from Yang Yi. So I gave it the spotlight. Otani reminds me so much of Kobe Bryant with his work ethic. Yeah. Oh, I would agree for sure. And he really, he really does feel like this is going to be the daughter that puts in the most work, maybe of our lifetimes. 
Yeah, and and that that clip that I always reference in the World Baseball Classic where Otani was pumping up his team before the final against Team USA, saying, like, forget all the stars that they have on their team, focus on the game and win this game. I and mean, that's also kind of like that Kobe DNA of, you know, he just wants to win at all costs. And that's something as a fan, you just you just love to see it. Uh, and especially on your own team, you love to see a guy that is just so focused on that. And for the first time in his career in, in Major League Baseball, the first time in six years, he's actually had a chance. He has a chance to actually win something. So yeah. this is very exciting. Akira Sano, welcome. Watching from Tokyo. I love it. Oh, that's really cool. And I expect I expect a lot of people from Tokyo and all over Japan to be tuning into Dodger games, probably on a regular basis. The Dodgers are going to generate so much money and so much publicity because Otani really is the biggest spectacle, maybe in all of professional sports right now. Like it's really hard for me to think of a bigger draw, maybe um, Lionel Messi, but he seems a little past his prime or Ronaldo, but I mean, from a global perspective, Shohei Otani certainly is in that conversation. And I want to add one more thing because they kind of poked fun at the Angels who deserve it, to be honest. But he looked so happy to not be wearing an Angels uniform this upcoming season. They threw some shade out there saying like he looks a lot better in blue than he does in red, which I mean, I agree. Dodger blue really fits Otani and good for him to get out of that hell hole. Like, I don't even know what the Angels are doing at this point. What a disaster over there in Canada. I don't Anaheim. think they, they know either, Kevin. Yeah, they don't know. I, I mean, I, I read a report somewhere that said they're not spending because he might actually sell the team and they don't want to put money on the books before that. But to not know and to be this close to the season to not doing this is just ridiculous. There's If you're not selling the team, why do you not have Blake Snell on your team already? What, how, how do you not already have him? Oh, well... I don't, I don't I think thought, anyone should pay Blake Snell nine years, though. That guy's insane. I thought well, Artie Moreno already, like, planned on selling the team before. Like, I felt like, and then yeah. he and then he came back out of nowhere. Uh, what is that? that that's yeah, already I, for you. I see a couple of comments about how players are getting asked about Otani, like not Otani, but everybody else is being asked about him. And I feel like that's something that, you know, will continue on through spring training. But once the season starts, I think everybody's going to just be, you know, focused on the actual results of the game. And I think this is just something that all these players, you know, are not upset to talk about. But if I know Shohei Otani from what I've seen of him, I don't think he wants the reporters to ask everybody else about him. I don't think he wants to be the center of attention like that. I mean, I, we saw it on the in the World Baseball Classic where there was that clip of him uh, – or, or maybe just a report where he said to everybody else, I, I just want to be one of the guys. I don't want to be, you know, the guy or, or like someone that you can't approach or anything like that. So I think this kind of, uh, you know, media treatment will last a couple more weeks in the spring training and then it'll finally, you know, kind of level out here. I mean, this is the first year, so it's going to be a spectacle palooza the yeah. entire time. So I think yeah. everybody kind of understands that. I think Chris Taylor, I heard him make a comment that, he ha he answers more questions about Otani than he does about himself, um, which is I mean that is that, that one is fair <laughs> for good like because for good reason. What is Chris yeah. Taylor the uh, most boring player? <laughs> I mean, and he's also been on the team for so long. It's just like yeah, okay, Chris, like just show up for spring training and 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 you know hit your weight. Like let's go. Like of course nobody's. I mean, I know he had the uh, the the polar plunge, which was kind of a funny thing that it was like a polar plunge but it was really just the just pacific ocean into the ocean yeah which you know is cold i mean the pacific ocean is cold i yeah. mean i've, I've grow, i grew up this we just all, in we all grew up here this just in yeah but in terms of a, a polar plunge i don't know about that it was kind of funny though to see uh all, all the guys running into the water and dave too dave roberts yep dave roberts better at mentoring them going in the water than some of his uh post postseason track record apparently <laughs> well that's that that event is exactly where dave thrives that's dave in <laughs> his element yeah i just can't wait to see shohei otani actually build chemistry and like a rapport with these dodger players because yeah. right now he's he's pretty much a stranger he I, i'm sure he's done some things in private with these guys he knows yamamoto somewhat well because they were teammates on the world baseball classic team we all know this um 
He knows Jose Moda from their days in Anaheim, but let's really see what Shohei, let's see who Shohei Otani really gravitates towards. Do we have any picks of who becomes Otani's guy? I mean, I, I, I think the obvious two are Freddie and Mookie because he does have some kind of a relationship with them from like all-star game festivities. Uh, and they're also just the two best players who are going to be hidden right in front of him. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that's my guess. But I could also see some, like, dark horse, like, bruised dark Gratterall in there. Yeah. 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 Like, a, like kind of like a, a Wanya Ribe, a Hunjin Ryu type yeah. of relationship. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. It'd be kind of cool if, like, if, like, Otani and Max Muncy became, like, super tight. Just I could see Lux. Out. Lux also. Yeah, I was, was going to say Lux. Oh, Lux, Lux yeah. is a dark horse. Yeah. Or, or Teoscar Hernandez, for that matter. Yeah. Haven't seen him once. Where where's he at? Yeah, he didn't show up. Did he? Did he catch no, it? He was there? He must still be in his hometown. Maybe that was the other interesting thing too. Was like Caleb Ferguson wasn't at any of these events. Maybe they had told him he was being traded, and that's why he didn't appear. That yeah. would make sense. And they just kept it under wraps because they didn't want to like do. They didn't want to steal a spotlight from all the charity events and Dodger Fest and all that. I don't know. I'm just throwing conspiracy theories out there, I guess. But yeah, I mean, I, mean, I just cannot be accurate. I cannot wait to see Shohei Otani play a baseball game with the Dodgers. Other than that, like there really isn't much else to talk about until we get to see it for now. It's just talk, talk, talk and hype, hype, hype. But he's going to explode. I don't know what numbers to expect him to post because it could be 60 home runs. It could be 40 home runs. Might depend on that elbow and how they want really want to utilize him, but should be an MVP worthy season. I, don't, I really don't think the elbow is going to affect him that much. I mean, it's first of all, it's his front elbow of his swing. So it's, you know, if you're, if you've swung a baseball bat before, you know, your back elbow is going to be more of a factor than your front elbow. Uh, second of all, he's done this before he, he has hit after this surgery for the angels and he was good. So I I don't think this is going to be really any kind of hindrance. I think they might put just kind of, uh, you know, load management stuff on him maybe at the beginning of the year, but I don't think he's going to want to sit out at all. And I don't think it's going to affect him. Totally. Since doom underscore Sal is asking, I do have more takeaways from fan fest. This is one of them thoughts on Blake Trinan's interview feeling better than 2021 david your guy. <laughs> i mean i kind of already talked about it a little bit but if he's even remotely what we're used to this is a f- absolutely massive signing and it's you can look at it as like a signing sure but I, it's it's just in a new addition we haven't had him for basically two years uh yeah and if you remember he's one of the best relievers in baseball when he's healthy He's a top five undisputed reliever in baseball when he's healthy. I I don't know what else I can say about that. I mean, adding that to a bullpen with already having Evan Phillips and Gratterall bringing back Brazier, probably going to get a bounce back from Vestia this year. I I mean, that's you're basically signing a top five reliever in baseball. And and it's kind of cool because trinan missed the kind of emergence of evan phillips like he wasn't really they, around we've never seen them together for the height of that so so if both of them are at the top of their game once yep. again like look out like that's going to be a deadly deadly bullpen i am so happy to see that the uh the vessel is returning because yep. we've missed him dearly uh i i love the way he goes about his business and i i love his attitude friend of the show we've had him on the mm-hmm. podcast before so uh, we're really, really looking forward to Blake trying. Yeah, to he's also just a guy that just loves to talk baseball and be around baseball 24 seven. And he mentioned at Dodger Fest that he was really bummed out that he didn't really get to hang out with the boys the last two years. <laughs> he's really good buds with Joe Kelly. They have a great thing going on. He likes Gratterall a lot, too. He mentioned that. And he yeah, he didn't get to spend much time around Phillips. They were next to each other at Dodger Fest. So they'll get to build some chemistry as well. So Blake Trinan, whatever about his other opinions, but in terms of being a team player and a clubhouse guy, he's always been an A plus in that department. 
And I haven't heard one teammate ever say anything negative about Blake Trinan. And he, Blake Trinan himself has said, or I should say he said it on Saturday, the Dodgers, are the best organization he's ever been a part of. And there's no reason to doubt that because he pitched for Washington and Oakland, if I have that right. So, yeah, I mean, there's no doubt he's, he's going to be a guy who gives you everything (laughs) he's got. Like he was willing, he, he basically sacrificed his last season to try and pitch for the Dodgers the season prior. Uh, So he's willing to give up the arm and the body for the team. So it's nice to see him at, you know, stuff like Mookie's bowling event and fan fest and the polar plunge and, and getting back immersed with the boys, as he said. And it's, and remember, it's not him out there. He's a vessel. Remember that. Yeah. You know, he's giving his body up for baseball and God. And correct. When you're, when you're that locked in, I'll take it any day. Fucking locked in all the time. (laughs) So Dave Roberts left it to the fans at Dodger Fest to decide what the top of the batting order is going to be. And the fans voted and decided Mookie will continue to bat lead off. They want Freddie Freeman hitting second. And they want Shohei Otani batting third. All three are talented enough that I don't think it's going to make a difference one way or another. But I did kind of find it a little interesting that they, it does seem like Dave is leaning towards Shohei Otani being the three hole hitter when in this day and age, it does seem like you want to have your best power hitter batting second. I don't think you can go wrong. Literally, any iteration of the three. I think you could hit any of them lead off. I think you could hit any of them second. And I think you could hit any of them third. So I am, you're not going to hear me complain about the top three once this year. I think that, that Freeman and Otani are so good. Just doesn't matter where they bat in the lineup. The one thing about Mookie that we have learned empirically is that he hits well in the leadoff spot, not as good in other spots in the lineup, but generally speaking, I agree with you, David. I mean, it just, it just, you know, just as long as they play, they suit up and play. It doesn't matter where they hit in the lineup. Um, this, this is the, the idea I think is, is that your, your number two hitter is going to get more at bats mathematically than your number three hitter. And so that's why you would want your number two hitter to bat second, to be in that kind of power slot, assuming that the guy before you gets on base, the lead off hitter. So I get, I get all of that, but I think just because, Freddie and Mookie have developed this kind of chemistry together, batting one, two in this Dodgers order. I think Dave smartly Mm -hmm. is keeping them kind of in position and just slotting Otani in behind them. Bro, bro man, 74 dude does bring up a good point though, that Otani does have better speed and usually you would want the faster guy batting in front. I mean, that's the argument we made when we talked about this, you know, is that we wanted a guy with speed because you look at Mookie who's not fast anymore and if he doesn't get on base then you know you get otani batting second he can get on base and maybe steal a bag and freddie can knock him in but also freddie's a great base runner as well i mean he steals he steals more bases than mookie does low-key fast both of them are faster than mookie at this point i think that's also a factor in which is crazy right by the way you can count on freddie to score from first on a double he can do that and he hits a lot of doubles yeah, I, I totally. think the way the way I see it is I, you know, if it was up to me, I would probably hit Otani second just because I want Freeman hitting behind him. I don't want I'd rather have Freeman hitting behind him than Will Smith hitting behind him. That that would be my only logic. I the speed, there's definitely an argument for the protection, uh, there. right? Yeah, for protection. You you, you don't want to be, you know, have him be pitched around. Uh and that's not a knock on Will Smith. It's just I'd rather have Freeman but I think, I think you'll switch. see. I think you'll see him switch it up a little bit. Mookie's going to be hitting first, but I think you'll see him mix it up. I was going to say that if 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 it if it works and they click, I mean, then why would you change it? But I think that they, you know, they're, they're gonna they're gonna make adjustments. They always do. Yeah, to me, it's the biggest question is who's going to back clean up. It seems like it's if it's Smith. a left-handed starter, Will Smith, but if it's a right-handed starter, I think you have to go Max Muncy or Teoscar Hernandez. I think. If, if he's, if he has the power numbers up, I mean, if he, if he eventually, if he takes that JD Martinez role, eventually, and that was frustrating because JD Martinez never back clean it for the Dodgers until like the very end of the season. If I have that right, how he is unsigned is beyond me also too many, too many Boris, too many years. 
Boris is Boris is holding this market hostage, and yeah, that's what he it's does. Pretty frustrating. Like Blake Snell doesn't deserve nine years. Cody Bellinger isn't a two hundred plus million dollar player. Love JD Martinez, but if he's asking for three or four years, then like know your role, dude. You're thirty six. Like teams just aren't going to throw the bag, especially with a loaded free agent class coming down the pipeline. And I think that's just what what's going on. But they're going to have to sign. I mean, spring training is just in a couple weeks, so someone's going to have to cave. I Game want want the chat to start asking some questions. I think it's a good time into the show where we can do some Q and A. So as you guys start to drop your questions in the chat, if you haven't subscribed yet, well, you need to subscribe. You got to hit that like button as well, and giving you a thirty second promo clip right now to talk about. Tick pick because first of all, they're the best site out there because they give you the best deals on your tickets, whether it's concerts, the Grammys were just the other night. There's going to be a lot of concerts to follow. Taylor Swift dropped another album. That's going to piss people off who hate Taylor Swift, but Hey, she crushed it. She's got the most Grammys ever for uh, album of the year. So go see her using tick pick wherever in Asia, I guess. Um, Shohei Otani bobblehead night. $300 minimum I've heard to get into the stadium Hell because yeah. people want that Tawny bobblehead. Well, if you're looking for the best deal, no service fees at checkout, download that tick pick app and you'll save some money on those fees at least. So no I, one in the I chats. Have... Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, it makes more sense. Okay. Cause I, I have one more thing to add to that conversation. I, like I said, I don't really care who go, who hits second or third, but I, I do kind of, insist on Gavin Lux hitting ninth because after the first time through the order, he essentially will become the leadoff hitter for those yeah. three guys. I want his speed on there and I want his on base percentage basically being the pseudo leadoff hitter. I've talked about this to, to you guys are definitely tired of me talking about this, but I think it's very important for this Dodgers roster and lineup and success to have a guy in that nine hole, exactly like Gavin Lux high on base can run, does everything at the top of the lineup, and sets the table for those three guys. That's going to create way more runs for everybody. And I think with Mookie's speed just completely disappearing on us, uh, you basically create a leadoff hitter in the nine hole. So I think that is is very important going forward. And I think they keep him there, and they keep him there. Even if he's hitting well, just keep him in that spot. Let that be his home. You know, from last year to this year, after the Gavin Lux freak injury, you basically had to bat your worst hitter ninth, which was yeah, Miguel it was, Rojas. It was terrorism. Just, just because that's just the only spot in the order that you could really put him in. Now you have Gavin Lux coming back. Now this is not just you're batting your worst hitter ninth. This is now becoming a weapon. And for him to be in that ninth spot, We've seen him have that success, flip that lineup over, give Mookie, he's going to have plenty of RBI opportunities with Gavin Lux, not only with his ability to get on base, stolen bases, but but he hits he hits gap to gap. So you're 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 creating another weapon batting ninth and I think that the Dodgers have seen that. Hopefully they follow that logic in the uh, in the opening day. Yeah. Yep. It's the logical spot and they've confirmed not that it was a surprise. Gavin Lux is the shortstop going into the season. Two things. One, with Willie Adamas being on the trade market, the Dodgers don't need him anymore. So you can just X that, let him go elsewhere. Lux is the shortstop. Done deal. See some questions about his defense. We'll get to that. And then second of all, they interviewed Lux at Dodger Fest, and the guy just looked so happy to be healthy. And he was really bummed. He, I think he even cried when he tore his knee and all that in spring training last year. Made a joke that his goal this time is to start survive spring training. So <laughs> please do so, Gavin. They're giving you the position. And you proved when you were healthy in 22, you were like a high on base guy. What was his on base? 370 or something? Yeah, it was substantial. And then he tailed off. So he has a great chance. Well, he to got get, hurt. That's what I said. But he has a great chance to reclaim that success. And I think nine makes a ton of sense. The guy that I'm actually excited about that's not a star is Outman because I do think he can make the big leap for the Dodgers 
in 2024 if he cuts down on that strikeout rate. I mean, this is a guy that just has a ton of power. And if you're hitting him like seventh in the lineup, like on some teams, he'd probably be the three or four hitter, depending on how strong their lineup is. But Outman, like in the bottom third of your lineup, like that's a cheat code because pitchers are going to be tired from facing the top dogs. And then they get a guy like Outman. They might leave a pitch over the middle and he's going to crush it to dead center. There were there were a ton of holes in the lineup last season, despite how successful the team was overall. You look up and down this lineup now, there really aren't any. So it is it just makes the lineup longer. And like we were talking about with Lux, he's another weapon batting ninth. And I think if Outman, the pressure, it, I mean, obviously there's pressure, right, to kind of repeat what he did and then kind of build on that. And like you said, Kevin cut down on the strikeouts. But I think with how much star power this lineup has, it, he can. He, the pressure is not going to be on him to be to be the guy or you know one of the top guys. So he can kind of just focus on his own game, bat sixth or seventh, and just you know work through it and and be and be successful. I think that's a perfect spot for him to be in right now. Sorry, Maria G, for keeping you waiting. Let's get to your question right now. Thoughts on Mookie's viral four second clip. So I did write this down because I was planning on talking about it. I believe she's referring to the idiots. Like, I don't know what they're doing over there at talking baseball with just trying to set, set up Mookie with his comments. Basically what happened was they took a snapshot from Dodger fest. Someone asked him about how teams are going to attack the Dodgers because they have Otani and all that. Mookie responded, Every game is going to be the other team's World Series. And then people all over on X got mad. Why? Because Mookie Betts in this circumstance was speaking nothing but facts. We've seen it every year. Teams get up to play the Dodgers. Like, why? Teams get up to play the Lakers. They get up to play any LA team. So why are all the people that are living on their farm out there in Atlanta, Georgia, or growing corn in Kentucky and all that, why are they so triggered by these comments by Mookie Betts? I mean, the Padres, anytime they play the Dodgers, that is their World Series. They literally, I feel like they hung a banner when they beat us in the NLDS. It's just insane. Players magically are injured and then come off the aisle just in time to face the Dodgers. It never fails. I think, look, he, nothing he said is wrong. Literally, that is completely accurate. Every single time the Dodgers will come into the stadium, the, the tickets are going to sell out, and the other team is going to have to get up for that game, and everybody's going to act like it's a huge game. Nothing he said is wrong. I think people are just mad at him for actually saying it out loud. I think because he's actually on the team, that's why they're mad. If if one of us three idiots said that, it, it would not make headlines. Nobody would care about it. It's because it's true. But I think because he's actually Mookie Betts saying it, uh, being on the team is, is why there's, there was a negative reaction online. Nothing he said is wrong. It's completely accurate. Yeah, and um, John Boy kind of tweeted just the word yikes with yeah, the yeah. Like, video. That's what, yeah, thank you yikes for adding what? that. Yeah, yikes about what? And the only thing that I the only thing I can think of is that he's saying yikes because this is a clip that could be bookmarked and you know played we have on that loop clip or whatever. Every year. No matter it's every, usually Dave saying something, but great. Go yeah. ahead, bookmark no, that I'm, one. See knew, if you can hurt us further. We knew when Dave said that the Dodgers are gonna win the World Series, all three of us were like, Oh shit, it's over. It's, it's pack it's it up. Over. Oh, not sorry. only are we not winning the World Series, but oh my god, Dave, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it's, it, it's kind of clickbaity. I, I, I don't, I don't like that because, because they know, I mean, John boy and the rest of the rest of those guys, like Dodgers nation or whatever, they know when they post something like that with a caption like that, they know it's going to get a lot of engagement and it did. And people are going to take off with it. My take on it is, is that people are so, you know, quick to criticize Mookie Betts about how he's kind of, to himself, he never really says much. He's not a really he's not a real vocal leader. And like, I would love to see more of that fire and that passion within him that we saw in that 2020 World Series when he's screaming after he you know robbed a home run. Like, I we want to see that fire and that passion. So then now when he comes to Fan Fest, he's all jacked up. He's got you know uh, Shohei Otani on his team now, Yamamoto on his team now, 
And he's talking about these other teams coming in to play the Dodgers. They get hyped up and it becomes their World Series. I mean, that's something as a fan, I love to hear my players say that because that means that they're fired up and they know that they have to meet that meet that moment in that game against that against that team. And he Kevin brought up the Lakers too. Hockey way at all. No, it's not who he is. It's not who he is. It's not and it, it's not who he is because Further in that interview, he was asked about his postseason failures, and he literally said he sucked and that he's yep. going to make it a priority for this season to play a full 162 plus. Also, that's just the that's just the crime in posting a four second clip or a five second clip yep. like that. I mean, just rip that shit out of context and put yikes on it. It's just like, oh my god, it's just it's malpractice. I mean, it really it is. It's just, Ever since it, that, they, John Boy did that Astros sign stealing thing ever since then they've kind of felt fallen off i feel like well, if freddie was, freeman was, said those wasn't it if freeman was, yeah, said those same it. comments no one would care if freddie freeman said it but because it was mookie bats for some reason i disagree have to be i think outraged. any dodgers saying that you're gonna get the same reaction because it's I, the dodgers I, I don't know i i think there's just like a general dislike out there for mookie bets for some reason freddie freeman like who could hate freddie freeman who could hate Mookie Betts? Yeah, I think they're the a lot same of people, level a lot of, of who could hate that. A, a except, lot of people, except Dodger fans when they you know, go for think, 15 in the playoffs. A lot, of, a lot of people resent Mookie Betts, especially Red Sox fans. because uh, I don't know about them. that. But I'm saying that, like, you're saying who could hate Freddie Freeman yeah. based on what? His, per, his, like, really nice guy personality? Well, guess exactly. what? Mookie, Mookie also has that. I, th I think people view them differently. Mookie's a really nice guy. Too nice. Mookie, yeah, but Mookie gets a lot of hate. Like he got shit on for his postseason, but well, Freddie yeah, was well, just not as, anybody's gonna you go but, for fifteen. No, but in the postseason, Fred, you should you get shit you on. Went, you interrupted me. Freddie Freeman was basically just as bad, but no one said a word. Oh, but please, we we destroyed I Freddie did. Freeman here. Yeah, I we destroyed, destroyed both him. equally. Yeah, Maybe we did, but I'm talking about the general public. They talk about Mookie, but no one really talks about Freddie. Well, the thing is, is that because because last year Freddie was great, and this has now been a third postseason. Was it a third postseason in a row for Mookie Betts uh, where it's like, been bad? Like two, 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 two yeah. in a row. I mean, that's why people are people are coming down on Mookie a little bit more. That's Freddie, fair. That's fair. You know, perfectly fair. Yeah, yeah. He's also getting paid twice as much. Bro, bro man, seventy four, dude. Who will have the breakout season for the Dodgers? And don't say Betts, Otani, Freeman. Breakout season. I mean, I mean, I guess I'll I'll go. I think Yamamoto is kind of a cop out answer, but uh, I mean, I'll go him on the pitching side, and I, I'm gonna say I don't know if this counts as breakout more so as a comeback, but I think Lux is gonna have a really good year. I think defensively he's gonna hold his own, and I think offensively he's gonna be around 280, get on base a lot, steal 20 bases. Drive in 60 runs. Good answers. I'm going Gavin Stone. If he gets another shot, he could get somewhere between 10 to 15 major league starts for the Dodgers. And I think he'll kind of mimic what Ryan Pepio did in a small sample size for the Dodgers last season. He just needed to get confidence. It wasn't really stuff for Gavin Stone. He just needs confidence. And I think a second full spring training. He was with the Dodgers, all those events over this past weekend. Like they're incorporating him. He doesn't feel like some minor leaguer anymore. He's a legit major league talent. Now I'm putting my money in Gavin Stone's bank. I like that. I'm going to say breakout season for Max Muncy on the defensive side. Okay. I think, he's, I think he's going to be a solid defensive third baseman. He talked about it the other day. That is something that I had been talking about on this podcast for a while. I was hoping that he would put more emphasis on his defense. And in an interview, he said that he did put more emphasis on his defense and that for some, for whatever reason, there were a few mishaps that happened last year, which we all watched and it got in his head and it frustrated him. And he knew that it was something that he needed to work, that he needed to work on. I love Max Muncy because he's so self-aware and he's so honest um, that I think he's going to come back this year and he's going to be a really solid third baseman. And even he said, he was like, I'm a better fielder than i showed last year i know that i am and i trust him dennis gonzalez thank you for tuning in on a regular basis who is most likely to be the opening day pitcher yamamoto or glass now 
It's a good question. Well, I think because they're opening the season in, in South Korea, not, not that I know that Yamamoto is not Korean, but I'm, I, I feel like they, they will have Yamamoto be the, maybe the opening day starter on the road. And then maybe Glasnow is the opening day starter at home. I think they can both pitch in Korea and then there's enough gap in between that they can circle back and then be on regular rest. For oh yeah, you're right. Cause there's that in. weird, there's that weird thing in the middle that you mentioned the exhibition games. Yeah. I, I mean, I know they paid him $300 million, but I, I don't think they go to him in game number one. Uh, he is, I know Kevin's going to yell at me, but he is still a rookie by definition in major league baseball. And Tyler Glasnow is not. Uh, if Walker Bueller was healthy, it would be Walker Bueller over both of them. I don't care what anybody says. Uh, but I think, I think they'll go both of them in Korea. And then like Kevin said, they'll be able to reset it. And I think it'll be, I think maybe then he'll get the opening day home stateside opening day. Yamamoto will get it. It's going to be Yamamoto. He's a superstar pitcher. No team's going to pay him $325 million and not view him as a top 10 pitcher in the sport. I don't care if he hasn't thrown technically in the majors. He's thrown enough years in Japan now. He dominated in the World Baseball Classic. He's like three Cy Young equivalents to his name. The Dodgers are super stoked to have him. Yamamoto is electric. And just because he hasn't thrown to major league hitters yet in the States, I don't care. He's their best pitcher. I've seen enough of him in Japan at this point. They believe in him. Why should I not believe in him? Yamamoto is the real deal. They're going to go to him in game one. No doubt about it. Playoffs is a different discussion, I guess. But in terms of regular season, he's their guy. Glass now is without a doubt number two. And then don't sleep on Bobby Miller. He We can talk about him later on in the offseason, but he's going to have a massive season as well. Yeah, I'm excited. Full season of Bobby Miller in the rotation. That's going to be really cool. And I just hope, I just hope that this rotation is healthy. That's all I care about. I don't care who starts game one, but I care who starts game one in the playoffs. So I just hope that they're ready and healthy. So Brian, I saw you drop that in the chat as well. So we'll give you a, a quick spotlight so that you have your name on the screen. But since Tyler Glassnow was brought up, I want to just talk about him for a quick second because the more I hear Tyler Glassnow talk, the more I start to love this guy, he's got the riz, as the kids would say. Everything that comes out of his mouth is awesome. Like he grew up a Dodger fan, another guy that was just super stoked, full of joy that he's going to be wearing a Dodgers uniform. He reminds me a lot of myself because he said growing up, he would go to Sunday day games as a kid at Dodger Stadium, watching Sean Green, who's his favorite player play. Like we're like the same Game. person there. <laughs> Jake's, Jake can relate. I think he's going to be awesome with the Dodgers and they're going to find a way to keep him healthy. So whether it's 25 starts, maybe they're smart about it. They know his history and glass now has the stuff to also be an ace. So the Dodgers have four really ace like pitchers that they're going to be able to corporate incorporate throughout the season. And who knows another rookie or a young guy like Emmett Sheehan might step up or Gavin stone as well. So for now, if they're healthy, we should be pretty happy about this Dodgers rotation. It looks a lot better than it did a year ago. Yeah. Let's see what else we've got going on in the chat. Um, boom, boom, boom. Just a lot of talk about Otani. That's good. What about uh, Kevin Haynes' comment there? The, the three lefties in a row in the lineup. Yeah, I'll get to that. Shout out to Steve G. Good show, guys. Love it. Gallegos, follow him on X. Uh, where's there's a lot of comments, man. I gotta keep scrolling. What's up, I Ivy? Up, I was doing a lot of talking. I was not following the chat. Well, I can I, I can just read this. Con I don't know how to uh, put it up on the screen because I don't think I have that power. But I can just read the. Okay, you you start talking. I'll find it. All right. So so uh, one of our uh, viewers, Kevin Haynes, said, will Dave place three lefties in a row in the lineup? Seven, eight, nine. I think versus a right handed pitcher, he's going to have a lot of lefties in the lineup. So he can't really do right, left, right, left. What do you guys think? Well, OK, so I assume you're talking about uh, Hayward, Altman and Lux, I would assume. Yeah. I mean, yeah, what what choice do you really have? I mean, you could move Altman up and and kind of 
flip him and put Tay Oscar to mix it up a little bit. Uh, so I guess you could do that. But but like you said, versus, versus a right-handed pitcher, I think it's a no-brainer because I think you'll see Hayward come out of the game when the pitcher comes out of the game. I don't think you're right. going to see Jason Hayward playing a lot of nine-inning games this year. Uh, I think you're going to see him play a lot of five- and six-inning games and then grab his, grab his seat on the bench for the rest of the game. So Or the other way around, you know. Yeah, or Taylor or, uh, you know, whoever. So, yeah, I, I think you could definitely see that, and you will see that quite a bit. I literally cannot find his comment. I'm so sorry, Kevin. It's like the fifth one down. I'm looking at it from the top, but it's over oh. now. You missed it. Sorry, <laughs> Kevin. That's all you right. Blew it. I know. But I, I also think I missed TQTO8's question. What happens at the shortstop spot if Gavin Lux can't handle it defensively? Rojas can't hit enough to be an everyday guy again. One or the other, I I think. I saw an article today that basically said that Miguel Rojas has been the best defensive shortstop in the major leagues over the last three years. And I believe it. Who's writing that article? No way. Diane Swanson is way better. It's based on defensive run saved. And he has wake up in the morning and decide to write that. And he has more defensive run saved than Dansby Swanson does. Whatever. It. You know he's a good defender. Who gives All a right, shit? Hold if on. I, I got a couple thoughts. One, how how do you wake up and decide that's what you're going to write about as a paid writer? Well, two, it's, an inter- two, it's interesting, isn't it? No, it's not really. Why? Just because that gets to my next point is, two, defensive stats are very, very flawed. Defensive run saved is a very flawed statistic. A lot of the, the outs above yeah, average but- is a very flawed statistic. I agree. It doesn't but you watched you watched the games last year. You watched it, yes, but it doesn't Ross. deal in actualities. It deals with a lot of unknown variables and and uncertain assumptions. And I don't like that. I get that. that but but I don't did like you not, that. Did you I not like watch Ro- Did you okay. not watch Miguel Rojas play shortstop? I did. I watched him. He was very good out there. Uh but right. what I what That's I feel I'm confident saying. what I feel confident saying he is the best defensive shortstop in baseball? Absolutely fucking not. Would I because there's no real way to measure that, in my opinion. All of these defensive metrics, to me, are a bunch of hocus pocus. I wouldn't go that far, but Miguel but Rojas. To, is- hold on, we didn't even answer the guy's question. Lux, I don't think we're gonna have. Well, I don't think we're gonna have to answer that question it's because I think he will. He will handle it just fine. I did. I answered it with. It's gonna be one or the other. Like. We got to either live with Lux's defense if it's bad, or we got to live with Miguel Ro- Rojas's bat if it's bad. I don't think it's going to be bad defensively. I think you might see more errors than Rojas for sure, but I don't think you're going to see it where it's uh, you know a complete liability. No, I don't think we'll ever get to that point. I mean, they do say it's his natural position, so hopefully that is true and he <laughs> is solid there. We'll see. It's been a while. It's been a while, but it's his it's his job to lose. And I did find Kevin Haynes' comment. I just didn't scroll down far enough, apparently. Maria G. Okay, we'll just answer a few more questions and we'll get to our final segments. How big will the ovation be for Corey Seager when the Rangers come to Dodger Stadium this season? It'll be loud. Should Everyone's going to cheer. I'm going to that game. I'm going to Yamamoto bobblehead night. Going to watch the Dodgers play the Rangers. People are going to erupt for Corey Seager. Guaranteed. Yeah, I mean, bring bring and, and he won't he won't show an amount he won't show an ounce of emotion. Either. Yeah, you'll get a he'll take his helmet off one time yeah. and that'll be that. <laughs> yeah, maybe a wave and a pitch clock and a pitch clock violation. I mean, yeah. he he won. I can't believe he, that guy called it on Bellinger last year. Yep, Good awful, stuff. horrendous. All right, Ivy, how would you rate my two mystery bag autograph ball pulls? Chase Utley and CT three two hour wait. I gotta oh. give you. I gotta give you a D. That's, I would not. I would not be excited about that. Like maybe if, if it Chase was a Utley one, it's cool. Maybe right. if Chase Utley can get into the Hall of Fame, you got some value there. No, he won't. Yeah, I, I'm with Kevin there. I I think you got a D on your hands. Chris well, Taylor won't be worth much. I know, but Chris Taylor's a huge fan favorite, so it it might have value in that regard. But in terms of you know, there you go, long term monetary value. There you hey, go, there's Kevin, Kevin Haynes, five there hours late. Sorry for the delay. I don't even know if this is a question, but I'm pulling it up. 
Broman74, dude. What is your big picture hot take? Oh, we, we usually save this for later, but Otani will not be an ace pitcher ever again. What the heck? Maybe, Maybe a, closer. a closer. I've Two. seen that take out there. Not happening right I away. I mean, he said, he said big picture hot take, so that is a hot take. It's a pretty hot take. Um, do you guys have anything that comes to your mind? I mean, a hot take. I, I, I've heard that thrown out there before, and I think it just has to do with the Tommy John stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know if being a closer is better or worse. Frankly, I would assume it's better for your arm in the long term. But again, I don't know. Uh, I mean, you can look at John Smoltz. He kind of did that. Uh, started a closer, but he also wasn't hitting. So there's no real precedent with this guy because he's just one of a kind. So I, I think he starts for, I don't think we're having this conversation for at least five years. I think next year he's back on the mound as a starter for sure. Easily. Yeah. I but agree. Five years into that contract, maybe. I mean, there's, I, I saw, I don't know if it was he said it or someone close to him said it that he may want to play the outfield later on. Which would be pretty sick. Not gonna he, lie. I believe he said it to Dave Roberts. That's what I, I think that's what I saw. What yeah, I so I could see that more so than the the closer for now, at least. All right, bro man. Big picture hot take. I was gonna save it, but Bobby Miller will be in the Cy Young finalist vote. Like top ten. Top well, they do top three now, don't they? You're saying he's gonna be a top three Cy Young this year? Yes. Okay. That is a big picture hot take. He has the stuff. He throws a hundred miles per hour. He throws like five elite pitches. Like yeah, he does. He, he basically is him and Spencer Strider. I feel like are the two faces of the National League future. They're gonna battle it out one of these years for Cy Young. Could be this upcoming year. Any any got any other takes or should we move on? I, I'm I'm so bad with hot takes. All right, let's move on. All right. I mean, you had your hot take last year when you said Julio Arias will win the Cy Young Award. How'd that work out? Yeah, I, I should have said end up in end up in jail. That's what I should <laughs> not really small. <laughs> well, Jake was unfortunately a jinx because I think the year before you picked Walker Bueller and he blew out his elbow. Yeah. How about you pick someone else on some other team? I won't year? pick. I'm not gonna fucking pick. How you about have that? to pick. Just don't pick a Dodger. You could pick Logan Webb if you want. Yeah. There All you right. Go. I'll, I'll pick Logan Webb. Actually, don't. He's a nice guy. I actually like Logan Webb. Pick someone else. Okay. Tony. I have no power. Or Daz the third. Would the Dodgers re-sign Kike after the trade? He wants to come back. It's down to the Dodgers and Angels. We heard this from the man, Bob Nigel himself. There just isn't room for Kike. So either they have to get rid of someone. There or should Kike be. I, 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 would, yeah. I would cast away Manuel Margot today. Like You haven't I, even seen him play for us yet. I've seen Kike play. I don't need to see Manuel Margot. We know he's a good defensive outfielder. I, I don't know. I think you need to give him a chance. Why? What do you mean? Why? What if he's great? I mean, then he's great. I, I'm oh, wow. personally giving Manuel Margot a chance before I cast him off for Kike Hernandez. All right. Okay. We'll do two questions and then it, and then if you have any other great questions out there, chat, drop them right now. Cause we're running out of time here. Aaron Vaughn. What up fellows? Just want to give you guys a quick shout out for being the most realist and best Dodger fan podcast out there. Thank you, Aaron. We appreciate it. This feels okay. like a David question. Maria G, thoughts on Bobby Witt's big contract? I mean, I, apparently going by the rules, it's bad for baseball. So <laughs> that's that's really my thoughts. Yeah, how dare the Royals do this? No, I mean, he's, he's a really good player and a really good shortstop, and I'm happy that the Royals are spending money because more teams should spend money. That's the main takeaway. More teams should spend money. More teams should keep their superstar young talent and long-term. And the Royals are doing that. And they're in a really shitty division, probably the shittiest division in baseball. So yeah. anything's possible. Why not build something there? I mean, the, the, the door is wide open for anybody in the AL Central. My Tigers oh. are going to win it. 
Go Tigers. I mean, I like what the Royals are really doing out there in Kansas City. They might be one more year away, though, from being a threat. I like that guy, Vinny Pasquantino. Yeah, I like saying his name. He's pretty good. That apparently, division is so bad. Apparently, he's not worth <laughs> Jesus Luzardo, though. Los 17s. I believe I met you at Dodger Fest the other day. How many games before fans get on Roberts for mishandling the pitching stuff? One. It, I guarantee you they'll be mad at him in Korea. They'll be saying, don't come back to the United States. Stay, Keep your ass in Korea. I guarantee it. Honestly, he does a really great job in the regular season, typically. Oh. Like mm. last year, he was pretty much flawless in the regular season. It's the postseason that that bites him every year. Yeah. He's not as bad as it feels like he is because when he's bad, it's in the worst possible situation. Oh, right, it's the postseason. Yeah. So he does get kind of a bad rap for that. But, oh, yeah, for the question, there'll be, there'll be tweets for sure telling him to stay in Korea. All right, he has, David. He, has, he also has less lefties in the in the bullpen. So because he has a lot of reverse splits guys down there, I mean, it's, go it's going to hopefully make his job easier. Yeah. Maybe that's why they traded Ferguson. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, we don't want you pushing, pulling the Ferguson lever anymore. <laughs> <laughs> He's gone. Uh, you know, know what's crazy is it's actually not a conspiracy. That might have been a factor. That might be a factor. David, I'm going to pass it over to you. I know you've got something up your sleeve. Are we doing this movie segment thing? If you want. Why not? All right. So Kevin asked me, asked us for seven segment ideas. And I saw this movie a while ago. And it's I, I saw the gif of this scene that I'm talking about recently. And it, it just makes me laugh every single time. So the idea is, what's the worst movie scene you've ever seen? Or what's the worst, like, serious, attempting to be serious movie scene that just ends up being a laughing stock. And for me, it's in the movie Man of Steel. And it's that's the Superman movie. And so the scene is there's this tornado, and the Superman is raised by Kevin Costner. So Kevin Costner is Superman's dad. And at this point in the movie, nobody knows who Superman is except Kevin Costner and, and Superman's mom. <laughs> so we are the, the stage is set we are on a a one lane highway in like fucking iowa or something and here here comes a tornado there's a big ass tornado coming sure and kevin costner superman's dad is getting people out of there he's he's funneling them in and superman is is across the road basically not that far at all like really not that far at all and there comes a point in the movie when the tornado is imminent, like we are, we are about to be swept away and it's just Kevin Costner and Superman is well within range to like be Superman and save his dad. But Kevin, Co <laughs> Kevin Costner just gives one of these and a quick little head nod, just a, just a no, put the hand up with the head nod, basically saying like, it's not worth saving my life to reveal that you're Superman. And granted, there's about 20 people here. This is not a stadium full of people. This is 20 random Iowa civilians who, if you just be Superman and save your fucking dad, you can <laughs> tell, you could tell these people, Hey, don't tell anybody. All right. This is critical that you don't tell anybody. I'm Superman. Don't say anything. And Kevin Costner just, Nope. Just let me die, son basically killed himself no reason to do that the cause of death was not tornado the cause of death was suicide you killed yourself kevin costner and it was trying to be a super serious moment and i fucking lose it every time i see this gift every time it is the most inexplicable movie death <laughs> for no reason ever did not need to die just killed his dad sorry that's just i can't i can't get over that i love that I have to see so that movie that's now. my worst movie scene ever, ever. If you ever want to make me laugh, send me that gif. Honestly, I did not like Man of Steel. Side, side note, he was the worst of all the Superman I've ever seen. Well, he, he killed he his no, dad. He was no Christopher Reeves, that's for sure. Well, yeah, that guy's the goat of Superman.
Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if this is the worst movie scene I've ever seen, but it's from a really great movie. So that's why it stands out to me. Okay. It's from the movie Spotlight, which won an Oscar and it's an incredible movie and I love it. But there is this one moment with Mark Ruffalo and Mark Ruffalo, who's a great actor. He tends to overdo it in at least one scene per movie. Um, in some movie, in some cases it's multiple scenes, but in this one, it's where they're, they're meeting with the spotlight team and they've got this big story about the Catholic church and the editor, uh, is telling them, you know, we can't go forward with it or something. And, um, Mark Ruffalo is realizing that basically the entire Catholic church knew about all of the things that were going on in the Catholic church and did nothing about it. And Mark Ruffalo freaks out and he goes, they knew, they knew, and they did nothing. And Damn. it just blew me away. I was laughing. <laughs> it's supposed to be the most serious moment. They knew and they did nothing. Oh, that's so good. It's just, if you go back and watch that scene, it's just fucking amazing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's brilliant. <laughs> I feel like you were triggered because as a journalist, it took a, another journalist movie to just upset you. Yeah, yeah, basically. But it's a great movie. It's just that one scene is just yeah. like, it just takes me out. Yes. What, what is the spotlight slander? I will not accept it, but you can have that I mean, moment. I love spotlight. There was no spotlight slander. It's just that one moment in the movie where Mark Ruffalo takes me out. But I love that. Fair, fa- fair, fair. That's fine. As an actor, you can criticize his acting as well. I'm Thank not going to. I'm not going to question any of your knowledge there. <laughs> I, I'll have to rewatch that scene because I don't remember it. To be honest, I, I watched. I watch a lot of movies once and then they kind of fade into oblivion. But a movie that I do remember because as a kid, I saw it and I realized as an adult now it is a shitty movie. But Masters of Disguise might be one of the biggest pieces of flaming shit comedies that has ever walked mankind dana carvey who was hilarious in wayne's world and saturday night live like he i think he went mia for a few years came back with this piece of crap movie and then disappeared ever uh disappeared after that is like has never really been seen again masters of disguise in particular the scene where he's with the girl and he's trying to get into some club or something and he's dressed as a turtle and he literally just starts saying turtle turtle and it's just super awkward it's like well known if you you'll if you see the scene you'll remember it because it's just that bad but like talk about a movie that was trying to be funny and it completely dropped the ball and i looked it up before coming on it has a one percent on raw tomatoes because <laughs> it was just that bad oh uh, that was good I still, I still can't get over Kevin Costner. That's I need to watch. I've never seen that. I gotta watch oh, that, dude. It's it's actually, I mean, it's an okay movie if you like like that kind of movie. But I, I just could not get over that scene. I remember being outraged the first time I saw it. There was no reason for him to die. None. Twenty people would have known at most. And even then, he could have just been like, ah, I just ran really fast. You just lie. You just say, I don't know what the hell happened. I just so, grabbed him. So really good take by bro, man. Any scene with Mark Wahlberg trying to be serious that it, he is an overrated actor. I feel like I've said that on this podcast before Mark Wahlberg. So overrated. The happening was terrible. Ted. Okay. But I don't feel like he wasn't the funny part in Ted. Ted was great. I feel like he did good in shooter. That was a good movie. Yeah. Shooter was great. He was a serious role in that movie. I wasn't I wasn't moved by Shooter. He was in that Four Brothers movie. That was just okay. I like that movie. Well, but yeah. All right. Chat, get your final questions in. We'll get to our final thoughts. Oh, God, I hated Pain and Gain. Just look that up. I'm, I'm done looking at just, my God, Mark Wahlberg movies. Okay, I think we covered everything here at the Incline Dodgers podcast. So final thoughts, guys. Go ahead, David. Uh, I mean, let's just not get hurt in spring training. Like I- I'm down to just play everybody like for a week and then just basically bring in the dancing lobsters, just bring in like Mark Gage or whatever the guy's name we just traded for is. Mark Gage. What's his name? What's his name? Matt Gage. Matt Gage. 
Let's just have Matt Gage pitch like nine innings in like every spring training game. I don't want anybody getting hurt. I don't need any freak injuries. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm very excited for this for this roster, and I, I don't want to see anything derail it prior to Korea. Yeah. Well, well that was a. Uh... Not the most uplifting note, but that's okay. What do you mean? I'm saying let's just not have anybody get hurt. <laughs> I'm very excited for this really good team, so let's not get hurt. Right. He's preaching health. Let's. We don't yeah. need to throw that energy in the air. Uh, well, if if Jake doesn't have the power to curse people, I don't either. <laughs> there we go. Let's, let's, let's go. Um, I'm I'm really looking forward to spring training. I just I, I can't wait for all the content. It's going to be you know through up the wazoo with with Otani now and just the spectacle of it. Um, I'm looking forward to possibly going back to Camelback Ranch this year. It's going to be a lot more exciting. Um, so I, I I can't wait for pitchers and catchers to report. Uh, we need it. Uh, we're you know we're losing football next Sunday. So or NFL we're losing next Sunday. So it, it's that that's the next thing on the calendar is baseball. And I couldn't be more excited for that. F1 is coming back. Oh, we got March madness coming up. Don't worry. We'll, we'll be preoccupied. Yeah. And the NBA. Yeah. Uh, we need it. I like those words from Jake. We need it. We need it. All right. Well, I'll drop the discord link right now. If you haven't joined our discord group chat, feel free to join. We talk a lot of Dodgers and rumors and MLB. So it's just a fun hang if you're trying to talk to some like-minded Dodger fans. So drop the link below, below in the chat. If you haven't liked this podcast yet or are a subscriber, please do that right now. If you're listening on the audio feed, we appreciate that as well. Be a subscriber, leave a five-star comment. And if you're tuning into this chat late, leave it in the YouTube comments. I want to know which player you think will have the biggest breakout season for the Dodgers in 2024. And I'll interact with all you guys in your YouTube comments. So on that note, I'm going to sign us out. And this is going to be a fun two weeks as I think the off season is still in motion and the Dodgers might not be done. It's being we'll held, see. held Devin Williams by Scott Boris. Devin Williams needs to be wearing a Los Angeles Dodgers uniform at some point in 2024. Make it happen, front office. The Brewers are going nowhere. Devin Williams in a Dodger yeah. uniform would be fucking insane. I mean, they just basically waved the white flag by trading Corbin Burns. Yeah. So it should be open season. Hell yeah. All right. We're peacing out. Thank you, bro, man. First time listener.